great privilege for me to be here tonight at Houston again. It's been some time since I've seen you, and there's been many great victories won, many sorrows has passed. Still tonight, I'm thankful I'm still saved by the blood of Christ, the Son of God. So thankful that I'm here again tonight at Houston to minister one of my longest meetings. We have 17 straight nights to be at Houston this time. That's the longest meeting I've ever held since our meetings has got into the larger calibers. I trust to God that it will prove to be a great meeting. Many of the afflicted people, sick, suffering, will be delivered during this period of time. And I trust also that many that are wayward and indifferent towards Christ will know him as their personal Savior during this time. And all together that God will get glory out of all that's done or said. I want you all tonight while the meeting's just beginning, a very bad night, just a few people out. I want you to try to help me during this time. I don't get to meet the people during these meetings that I would like to because that I use my time in prayer. I must be prepared for these things that comes on such as the healing service. I come here to help, and I must, my help cometh from above, and I, I must stay in contact with God constantly if I expect to help someone else. And as well as I would like to take each person and have a good private talk with each one of you, that's almost impossible in this earth. But there's another time coming when I believe that we'll have all the time to spend with each other that we desire to spend a better land where we won't have to be busy praying for the sick and the afflicted. There'll be none there. We'll be living door neighbors to Jesus and there'll be no more sickness and suffering there. God hasten the day when all this troubles will be over and then we shall see him face to face and know as we're known. That's what we strive for. That's what I'm striving for tonight is to try to make that my home. And not only that, but see how many that I can bring along with me. Or it's just as real, more real than we're here tonight. <clears throat> the meetings will continue here for quite a few nights. Then we have two empty spaces, two nights, that we'll try to arrange some other auditorium. Then we go to the Coliseum. We're expecting a great time. Everyone, bring out your sick and afflicted. And come bring the sinners. As many times when miracles are performed or something is done, it changes people's hearts their attitude towards Christ. Here recently I had a meeting, one of the largest conversion all were called at one time. I heard 2,000 accepted Jesus at one time. 2,000 people came to Christ. And I trust that I'll meet every one of them over in the other land. Now, a healing in, in the campaigns, you we had that at the desk. And um, so get one, especially you sick people in the line, I want you to read that little pamphlet, he'll send it on high. If you have any kind of sense, take it in here. And um, so, we're not here for money. We're here to help you. That's our hearts. We're here to help you. Now, I can only speak of what I know that's truth. Now, if I tell you the truth, you should believe me. And if I speak of myself and say something that God has done, and God does not speak back of that, then that's wrong. But if I tell you something that God has done, and God comes down and testifies the same thing, then you ought to believe God. Isn't that right? Now, what I tell you tonight, I want each one of you to remember just what I tell you. And then, if those things doesn't happen just the way I say they are, then when the service is over at the end of these 17 days, you can go around town and say, Brother Bram's a false prophet. But if God testifies back just exactly what I say is the truth, well, then you believe God if you don't believe me. Isn't that right? Then you can go around and say, the Lord is right. The Lord has told us the truth. He sent us. Now, as far as a, a gift to heal, there are many people who do not understand what gifts mean. There's nobody can heal you but Christ. I don't care how much a gift you possess. Christ is the giver, see, and you're only healed through Christ. 
I wish to read just a little scripture now and explain to you some of the operations of the gift. And then you'll know how to come. And then you'll, I'll tell you what we can do. How'd you like to do this, all of us? If you could just take this little group here, and I, maybe uh, probably 1,800, 2,000 people, something like that. If you, could, if you could take this little group here tonight and, and settle it down and let everyone believe just exactly what I told you to be the truth, there will be a meeting that will shake Houston. That's right. You will. Now remember, if you could just take, maybe there's some of it you do not understand. And frankly, friends, there's much of it that I do not understand. I just accept it. Don't ever try to figure God out. You can't do it. God is not understood by knowledge. God's understood by faith. Is that right? What if Peter would have tried to figure out how deep that water was and how impossible it was for him to walk on that water? He'd have never walked. See? But he just took Christ at his word and walked on. Well, that's the way I did this. I just took him at his word. And there I went. And you just take him at his word tonight. And if you maybe be a sinner and do not understand how to take God at his word, then God sent me here. I want you to take my word for it and see if it doesn't come to pass. And God will bless you. Now, can we bow our heads while we talk to our maker just for a moment? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight, and our hearts are made to rejoice in our, the, our salvation because that Jesus, the Redeemer, has come and has blessed us. He came to the earth, the Messiah, uh, made after the manner of sinful flesh and taken our sickness upon him, our iniquities, and he bore them to Calvary's cross, and then ascended on high, sitting at the right hand of the majesty tonight, making intercessions, become our high priest, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And tonight, after all these hundred years has passed, isms has rose, fanaticism has come and gone, but yet the glorious power of the Son of God still rules and reigns in the hearts of thousands of his people. And now I pray thee, Lord, as we are entering into this uh, great uh, revival that we believe is just on the threshold of it now here at Houston, that the glory of God will come down in our midst and may every crippled, blind, afflicted, twisted, spastic, mental deficiency, all manners of diseases be healed here. May thousands of people come flocking around the altar, giving their hearts to thee. The Holy Spirit be poured out. That'll just, Lord, may 17 days not even start it. May it go on and on and on until thy beloved Son appears in glory. And we may appear with him, clothed in his righteousness, to look upon him. Bless us, Father. Now, as I, a poor, humble servant, stands tonight to make this great uh, proclaim here, or proclaim this great thing that thou hast done, and may every listener here have faith, and may your spirit, Lord, that's perform these things, may he stand in this meeting tonight. And verify everything that's said, and night after night. And may there be an old-fashioned revival here that will shake the city and every church. May thousands be born into the kingdom. Grant it, Father. For we ask it for the glory of God in the name of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Exodus, the 23rd chapter, very familiar verse that I read usually in the starting of the revival because of this is a, this is deals something with the way God is dealing today. God speaking to his servant Moses and sending him. The 20th verse of the 23rd chapter, if you're taking it down and read down to a portion of the 23rd verse. And behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee to the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. My name is in him. But if thou will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then will I be an enemy to thy enemies, an adversary to thy adversaries. For my angels shall go before thee. God speaking here to his servant Moses. It was a time that, that the children of Israel got away from God and got away from his precepts and so forth. And it had gotten in trouble. 
and were down in Egypt in the Egyptian bondage, and there come a great need. As long as they were bearing presumptuously and had need of nothing, why, they went along all right. But when God's prophetic time come to pass after he promised Abraham that his seed would sojourn in this strange land for 400 years, and he would bring him out by a strong hand, then when the hour of the time of the promise drew nigh, there rose up a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. No matter how impossible it seems that it will not be, when the time of the promise draws nigh, God will make things heap up to fit his prophetic promise. Do you believe that? He always does. He always. It's always that way. Who would have thought those people, how they were respected and almost worshipped because of Joseph, that young prince that was down there that told the, the dream and saved Egypt many times in a space, short space like uh, 400 years that they ever forgot him. But when God's promise drew nigh, there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And he caused taskmasters to be put upon the people and, and so forth. And they began to be uh, burdened and they cried to God for the cause of the reason of the taskmasters. And then during this time, after they began to cry, well, God had a peculiar thing to happen. Now, it's to my humble belief that gifts are not handed out with hands. Gifts are foreordained of God. Gifts and callings are without repentance. You can say things and try to make these things act right and believe right and, and work right, but they are not unless God himself is behind it. It's not nothing you try to bluff. You can't bluff Satan. He won't be bluffed. You've got to know where you're standing. That's right. And gifts and callings are without repentance. They're born in the world. God forced these things and knows his prophecy, what's coming to pass. And he starts something here to meet it up there. And when he's seen that the time of the people is going to need this, he had a little boy born, a peculiar, odd birth by the name of Moses. He was given the name of Moses from Pharaoh's daughter because he was taken from the water, if you know your the Bible Sunday school story of it. And then when he became the age of 40 years, God called him for his purpose. And he thought surely that, that the people of Israel would understand what he was sent for, but the people misunderstood Moses. Now, get this close, friends. The hardest thing that God has ever had to deal with his people is to get one mortal to believe another. That's the hardest thing God ever had done. To get one mortal to believe. Well, they believed Jesus would have been the son. They could believe he was the son of God. They believed God. But he said, him being a man makes himself equal with God. How could he, a poor peasant, how could he be a man born in a manger, a background like he had from a poor family, raise up one garment on him and live the way he did, not even a place to lay his head. The foxes has dens and the birds of the air has nests, but the son of man has not. How could that man be the son of God? How could he be what he claimed to be? But he was, wasn't he? He was. Now they believe it, but it, it was too late for them now. Their destination is sealed away, those who rejected him. And God sends those things that people might be simple and humble. And listen, friend, more simpler you can be, more God can deal with you. I'm not against education. Educations are all right. But people get so highly educated to they think they know more about it than God does. And then they miss the goal. You've got to forget all you ever know in your own knowledge to know Christ because you just come childlike and accept him. That's all. That's the way you accept God. And more simple you can get, more humble and get away from yourself, your own ideas. Just take God's word for what it's worth and believe it. And it's by faith that these things are coming. Not what you can figure out, you'll never be able. There's never been a man in the world, no saint or no one has ever figured God out. You can. So don't think that you can do something that they cannot do because and he can't be. That's right. You just believe him. That's what he wants you to do. Not try to figure it out. But when the time of the promise drew, then God sent this Moses down there and the people said, Who made you a ruler over us? Why, you think you're someone great. That wasn't Moses' attitude. He was sent for a deliverer knowing that the time was there and he thought surely the people had been reading the scriptures and things 
and they would know that the time of the promise was near, or been reading the promise of Abraham, that the time was near, at hand. And they failed to read. Can, does, am I standing too close to this mic? Does it rumble up back there? Back over to balconies back there. Can you hear me all right back there? If you can, raise your hand. I haven't got too much of a voice. But when the promise drew nigh, they thought surely that they would understand. But the people of God, usually Satan works right in there with their understanding and makes them dull of understanding. And there they miss God nine times out of ten. But God had his promise there. And then when Moses went out to deliver him, well, they, they refused him, rejected him, and it cost them 40 years more suffering. Isn't that right? 40 years more suffering. Moses run to the back side of the desert, of course, and after a while was finally called again of God when the people began to groan and crying. And, and then the same Moses that they rejected and accept Pharaoh yet as their leader, this same Moses God sent back to him to be a leader and to have jurisdiction over him. Now, the... The peculiar part of the sending of Moses is what I want to get to you. Moses was herding his uh, father-in-law's sheep, Jethro, on the backside of the desert. And one day uh, an angel appeared to him in a burning bush. Now an angel came down to bring the message to Moses and otherwise was to be his guide. Man, or they can't, you can't guide yourself. There's two ways. That's your way and God's way. And when you're in your way, you're out of God's way. And you have to forget your own way to find God's way. And man cannot lead himself. He was called a sheep. We're likened to sheep. If there's anybody around here who knows anything about raising sheep, when a sheep gets lost, it's perfectly helpless. It'll just stand in blade till it dies, that's all. It's helpless. And we, without a leader, are helpless. And Christ is our leader. And God was Moses' leader, though he sent a, an angel to lead him. I send my angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee to the place which I have promised. The angel was to be his leader. The angel performed the miracles. Moses never performed any miracle. The angel of God in Moses performed the miracle. You see what I mean? The angel of the Lord was with him. The angel led them, performed the miracles. Now, God has always, by all men, through the scripture, through all ages, has ordained that angels should guide the people. There was Moses. There was Daniel. And oh, how many more could we say all the way down? Someone was speaking to me here not long ago and said, But Brother Branham, <coughs> pardon me, said not after the Holy Ghost has come, no angels guides the church or guides individuals. No, sir. Said it's the Holy Ghost that guides it. That's misunderstanding between angel and the Holy Ghost. That is error. The angels led the church right on and still leading the church. Correctly. How many would say that Philip had the Holy Ghost? Let's see your hands over the building. How many think Philip had the Holy Ghost? Philip, the apostle Philip, sure. They, they, or he did, didn't he? Who was it spoke to him down there at, at Samaria and told him to go to the desert Gaza? An angel. Did he have the Holy Ghost? Sure he did. How many says that Peter the apostle had the Holy Ghost? He preached the, the inauguration sermon for the church on the day of Pentecost. Well, when he was laying in prison up there, and who was it come into the and touched him and brought him outside? The angel. Is that right? How many said St. Paul the Apostle had the Holy Ghost? Let's see your hand. When the ship was tossed about for 14 days and there's no hopes at all, and he come out there and shook his hands and heart and I guess glory to God be of a good cheer. The angel of the Lord, whose servant I am, stood by me last night. Is that right? How many believe John the Revelator had the Holy Ghost? The whole book of Revelations was showed to him by an angel. Is that right? And they had the Holy Ghost, friend. The angel, where it's not a worship of angels, it's God sending his ministering spirit in the church to minister to the people. There's no flesh can glory before God. If anybody could have gloried, it would have been Jesus. But he said, it's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Is that right? They said, we believe God. He said, if you believe God, believe also in me. 
Now, when the angel came to your sermon here, he said, if you get the people to believe you. Now, there's a hard thing. If you get the people to believe you. How many believe God? All of you. You believe Christ. You believe the Holy Ghost. Now, that's not the question tonight. I'm glad you do that. That makes you a Christian. But that is not what I'm trying to get to you, you now. I get to that when I make my altar call. You just believe them first. If you're not in connection with them, you'll never know this. But as much as you believe in them, you still got to believe that I'm telling you the truth and what I say is the truth. Jesus was a man. He was, his hands was bound and tied to any miracle or anything, any kind of a miracle, because the people did not believe him. And the very people that believed God killed him. Is that right? No matter how much they believed in God, they were very religious, orthodox, very religious, and they believed God, but to believe him, oh no, uh, see, that was too much ma a man, they couldn't believe no man, they could believe God, and tonight so many people can believe God, sure, you believe Christ, you believe the Holy Ghost, and so forth, but when a man comes to you and tells something, that's hard to believe, uh, I don't know where I can believe you're not, friend, that's where it's at, see, there. that's the reason God came, that's the reason you're pastor sometimes. When your pastor comes to you, the reason he can't help you, you've got to have faith in your pastor. You've got to believe that he's a man of God, sin of God, to do these things for you. Now, divine healing died out for a while, here a few years ago. It just let down, as it has to the age of the history. It's let down so often. And during that time, cancer broke out. Sickness in the church. Oh, my. Eighty percent of the people are sick now. And the people, medical science, I salute them. They do great things. They make medicine to sell. And um, I said to sell. All right. It's all right for those who want to take it. It's all right for them. But look, but in the face we got today the best doctors we ever had. you believe that? We got the best hospitals we ever had, have we? We got the best drugs we ever practiced with, haven't we? And we got more sickness than we ever had, haven't we? Because we got more unbelief than we ever had, haven't we? right, exactly. Only God's the healer. That's right. And did you ever notice, right in the days when we got all these fine drugs and operation and surgeons and so forth, constantly they are building infirmaries for the incurable. Is that right? And there never was nothing that ever come before our Master Jesus, but what he was more than a match for. There's no incurables to him. All things are possible. Is that right? And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? There's nothing too incurable for him. Now, when the people begin to cry out, God, do this for us, do that for us, send us deliverance, send us deliverance, thousands of his people dying yearly, cancer and so forth, then God heard their cry. And don't you think it's just as possible for God to send down deliverance for the sick people as he did to bring the people out of their bondage back there in Egypt? Isn't he just as kind-hearted to your cry, listen to your cry, same as he, to theirs? He promised in the last days that he would have a church that these signs would follow them. Isn't that right? Well, don't you think the last days are here? Isn't it time now for these things to happen? Why, it's here. We got it. Amen. It's here. You'll see it. And Moses, of course, he didn't want to go. It was hard because he wasn't a man of good speaker, and he wasn't eloquent and so forth. He had many things, slow of speech and many. But God had ordained that man to do that job. It must be done. Now he gave Moses. He said, they people won't believe me. He said, he gave him two signs then. He said, you go perform this sign. By casting the serpent down, or the snake, uh, the rod down. He said, if they won't believe that, then I'll give you another sign. And if they won't believe the first sign, they will believe the voice of the second sign. Now, he was given two signs that the people who rejected him might believe that he was sent of God to deliver the people. Is that right? I may believe that story is right, say amen. That was true. Well, isn't he the same God tonight? Is that miracles impossible tonight? No, they're not. And they're just as possible as they was then. If God would deliver his people out of the bondage back there uh, from under the Egyptians, so can he deliver the people from under the bondage of sickness 
because he died for that purpose. It's in the plan of redemption. You are redeemed. You're, when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's the earnest of your salvation. Is that right? In other words, it's a down payment. And if it'll make us feel like this on the down payment, what will it do when we get the full benefit of it? It'll be glorious for us. Well, then, do you believe that you'll raise again and have an immortal body? How many believe that in the, in the resurrection? That you'll raise and have an immortal body. Divine healing is the down payment or the earnest money of your immortal body. My. See what I mean? You've got to have, it's the evidence that you will have an immortal body. When you see a, you'll see come to this platform, little old crippled, twisted children. You'll see them stand here all misformed and uh, out of shape. And you'll see with your own eyes, see their hands and arms come straight and walk off the platform, normal children. You'll see people come here to all kinds of conditions and see them heal and leave the platform. What is that? That's the down payment. That's the earnest. To know that that person someday, if they stand the blood of Christ, will receive an immortal body. Cancer ridden, blind, deaf, and dumb. It's the earnest of our salvation. Now, in the calling of this time, going out on, on, on this, I, to, I was born of a very humble parent, a very humble home. I have no education at all, and I'm not, uh, when I made that remark a while ago about education, I wasn't trying to take crutches for my ignorance. But, what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't take education to know God. It takes a submissive heart to know God. And I, I was raised for I was raised in an irreligious family. But from the very time that I was born, something happened. Not of my goodness, not of my parents' goodness, but by the foreknowledge of God. He brought it, I don't know why. I guess to show that he could choose what he wished to, whether it come out of the Vatican City or, or he could take it out of the rubbish heap and make it to me, wherever it come from. Then, on down through life, many of you know the story. You've read it. Of how it would appear in different forms. When I was a little boy, just about 12 years old, it made its first, about seven years old, it made its first visible appearance as a wind in a bush. And then on later, knowing nothing about religion. Only thing I know, somebody told me there was a God. That's all I knew about. On until I was a man. And then, after being converted and become united... Baptist Church, and one day on May the 7th, while coming in, and I was uh, a game warden in Indiana. By the way, on the street today, I met a, a man, he's maybe here in the auditorium now, uh, Mr. Price from Cordon, Indiana. I used to stay at his house when I was patrolling through there, and he's probably in the building now. Little did I ever know that I'm meeting him on the street in Houston, but he and his wife were here, they were vacationing through to Florida and came by for the meeting. And there was something pulled at my heart all the time. But on that day, it made itself visibly known. It was a man of about six foot tall, weighing some 200 pounds. When it came down, it would come a few years before that, it come down in the form of a light, hung over where it was at. It's come down many times in the form of a star where thousands of people stood and looked at it. It's made its visible appearance right in the auditoriums and so forth. And different things have taken place. This time when he come, he was a man. And he, I, I was scared. He walked towards me. And he said, Do not fear. I'm sent from the presence of God. So to tell you that your peculiar birth and, and peculiar life has been to indicate that you're taking a gift of divine healings to the people of the world. And said, and, uh, and said, If you'll get them to believe you and be sincere when you pray, there will be nothing stand before your prayer. Well, I said, I'm uneducated, sir. He said, I'll be with you. And said that you might know it will come to pass that you'll take people by the right hand and your left. And said you'll feel the results of it. Now I call it vibration. Up on your hand you'll become familiar with that. And you'll tell people all of their diseases and what they've got in their body. And then if you'll be, now when I was in Texas the other time, that was an operation. Is that right? Any of you was in my meeting before, raise your hand if that was an operation. And if this, now you people raise your hands, all that was in my meeting and know that was an operation. Not perfect. Because I, I guess it's a disease is a whole lot, see? Because I didn't know how it felt. I feel a funny feeling, sometimes female trouble and cancer, I couldn't detect it, it sounds so much like, but it felt so much like. You just see the visible results on my hand, and so forth. And I told you people, now remember, I told you people, I said, he told me, if you'll be sincere, 
see, that will come to pass, that you will tell the people the very secrets of their hearts and the things that they have done in their lives that's wrong, and so forth. If you'll be sincere with what I have given. Did I say that? How many remembers me saying that? Well, that has come to pass. They were standing at Calgary, or at um, Regina, Saskatchewan, like, about three months ago. I was standing on the platform talking like this to my audience, and we were having a great meeting. Some, I guess, close to 10,000 people were gathered in for that night at the pavilion, or the, the Queen Gardens it was, out where they had the stampede. And I was uh, speaking, and I said, now the Lord has told me that if I be sincere that someday, I did in each meeting, it would come to pass that the secrets of people's heart would be told. I'll just give you this before we close. And I turned around to get a drink on the platform, and they was forming the prayer line. And when I turned around to get a drink, Reverend Mr. Baxter, my Canadian manager, I was taking a drink of water, and he take this handkerchief and just wiping the perspiration off my forehead. He said, God bless you, Brother Branham. I said, thank you, Brother Baxter. And I turned around, he walked around, and there stood a lady standing with a microphone who had been brought up in the prayer line. And um, I walked over like that, and as I looked at the lady, I said, how do you do? And she said, how do you do? Something happened. I, I knew there was something that happened somewhere. I never felt it like that before. It was that anointing. It doesn't feel like the Holy Spirit. It's a real sacred feeling. And I looked at that woman, and she was standing there, uh, uh, her regular size, and I seen her get real little and start going back. Now you'll hear that spoke right here. And I seen a little bitty girl standing way down where she went down to a little bitty girl about 12 years old. I seen her sitting by death. I said, something's happened, friend. I see a little girl. That woman left me. I said, I see a little, a little girl. She's sitting in a room, she, a school room. She's hitting her pencil. No, it's a pen. Oh, I said, I, I see it fly. It stuck her in her eye. And a woman began to scream it. And it left off. She said, Brother Bram, that was me. I'm blind in my right eye. She said, the pen stuck. I said, well, I never had anything like that. I said, well, say. And there she went back again. I see a young lady, about 16 years old, and she was just running as hard as she could. And she had a big ribbon tied on her hair, on a double plait hanging on her back. She had on a checkered dress, and she was running real fast. And I looked, and there was a big yellow dog that chasing her. I said, I see a young lady with a checkered dress, beginning to tell just what I was seeing, looking in front of me. I said, she goes up on a porch. I see a lady to take her and run it. She started screaming. She said, that was me when I was going to school. I said, I never thought of it before in my life. I said, something's happened to your friends. I don't know what's the matter. And I, start, I said, let me have your hand, sister. And I took her by the hand and started to, to I said, well, I, I don't feel any vibration from it. And I was looking down at her hand. I looked up again. And I seen a lady coming from a white house, or from a barn, red-looking barn, coming in towards a white house. She had an apron holding something like this. And she was walking slow. And I see her come. I said, I see a lady coming. I said, sister, it's you. As a normal time, then I could recognize being the same woman. And I said, now I see the lady, you, you started up the step. And I said, there's a flower bed over to your right, and the steps goes up like this. I said, there's something wrong with your back. I see you can't get up the step. And I said, you lean over sideways, and you're crying. And I heard her say, if I can ever get to Brother Branham's meeting, it'll be over. And when I said that, somebody caught the woman, she started fainting. And when she come to, her blind eye was normal. Her back, she could just move it. She arthritis was fine. She could just move her back anyway, just perfectly normal, like that. And I said, well, something has happened. And then Brother Baxter grabbed the microphone. He said, Brother Bram, that's just what you spoke of a while ago would come to pass. And everybody began screaming all over the building everywhere. And I heard crutches rattling. Now look, and here come a young fellow. He said, Brother Bram, trying to hobble on his crutches. He said, uh, uh, tell me what to do. I said, well, brother, dear, I said, I, and the usher's come to pull him off the platform because he's coming down a prayer card. And um, I said, just a minute. He said, uh, well, brother, I said, you go back and get your prayer card, sonny boy. And just as he, he said, well, tell me what to do. Only thing, is just a crying, you know, and he said, that's all I want you to tell me, just what to do. I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I said, just a minute, don't take him, ushers. I said, you left Regina Beach this morning. I seen him standing beside a, a I said, you called a bus. I seen up over the door, said Regina Beach. I said, I see a man and a woman refusing you to go. That's your father and mother. He said, that's right. And I said, and I see another man loaned you some money, which is, looks like your father. He said, it was my uncle. And I said, I see you. You're, now I see you in a room. 
and it's got a bay window. You're looking out the side. So that's my aunt sitting right over there. I'm living in her room like this. And what was to do, Brother Branham? I said, do you believe with all your heart? He said, with all my heart. I said, stand on your feet. Jesus Christ has healed you. And down on his crutches, both legs come straight and down through the building he went, just a glorifying God. And from that it started one after the other, and it never has ceased yet. That's right. That's true, friend. It will come to pass that they won't hear the first, they will hear the second. Then, a few nights after that, I was over at Windsor, Ontario. We had 14,000 in that meeting there. There was a man in the meeting who thought that that was just a bunch of makeup. He went and got a prayer card and one of the lines pretending that he was sick and in need. And he went and wrote on the prayer card. He had all kinds of diseases and so forth like that. And come around and give it in to the, the man, uh, the prayer line manager. I never see the cards. They take the cards down there. So he thought, I'll just see what this is all about. And when he come in and put that on the prayer card down, he come walk up. I said, good evening, sir. He said, how do you do? Now I took a hold of his hand. There was no vibrations. I looked at him. I seen him and two men standing in a room across the table, making it up. I said, why would you purpose in your heart to try to deceive somebody? I said, God is apt to strike you dead right now. And he fell down on the floor and began screaming to the top of his voice. He said, God have mercy on me. And I said, why would you do that, friend? He said, Brother Bram, I, I thought it was just makeup. I, I, I honestly, is there forgiveness for me? There was, here a few nights ago, oh, woman, people, when they come to the platform, ugly, vulgar things that they've done down in their life. I remember, friend, those things are told publicly right here before this audience. What you've done in your life is told right here. So if there's anything upon your heart and you do not wish to be known, stay out of the prayer line if you don't want it to be known. Unless that you come with a perfect faith or ask, ask God to forgive you and put it under blood to see a forgiveness or whatever it is. Because I will not be responsible for what is said, what is brought out because if it's in your life, it's coming out. And I just remember that because God has promised it. It hasn't failed yet and it will not fail here in Houston. That's right. God is still here and he will answer. Now what is that? You say, Brother Branham, what does that mean? One time I was a little afraid to make things. But here's what it is, friend, that I can get it to you. Those things, the diseases are told. It's perfect. Secrets of their heart. If they won't believe the first, I can't get them on that first one, then they will on the second one. It goes right back and begins to dig up their life and tell them. Now, what's that got to do? Now, give me your undivided attention a few minutes. Friend, that doesn't heal nobody. That only brings the person up in faith. And when that person here, he might come tell me he's got faith. And I'll take his word for it. But when you're under the anointing as it is right now, you can't come and deceive that. Or I know when he's got faith or not. He might think he has faith. There's a thing that people think they got faith when they haven't got faith. Isn't that right? But when they're way down here and saying they got faith, it isn't up here. It's like tuning a string on the instrument. When it comes up and coincides with this up here, then the thing's ready. Any demon that's got that person bound has got to turn loose when that type of faith comes. And you don't have to be up here. It'll act right out there, wherever you are. Now, the only thing that is to do is to stimulate faith of the people that they might see God's willingness to heal the people. Now, as far as it comes uh, to healing, it's your faith in God. Your pastor can anoint you with oil at your own church, and you have faith in God, it'll bring the same results. That's right. God's the healer. No man's the healer. God's the healer. These gifts are only to show what God's attitude towards the people, to get you people back to believe in God, because if you haven't got faith enough to believe for your sick body, how you would have faith enough for the rapture? See? The people's got... Jesus asked this question, when I return to the earth, will I find faith? There's got to be a great church full of faith. And God set these things down to stimulate faith, to bring out faith, to prove what faith is. See what I mean? And those things, uh, that's the way it, it operates. Now, uh, my neighbor and somebody is not necessary, but I thought I'd tell you something's happening right now that you'd know. And that you'd know that, now that's right, isn't it? 
day that you were very highly elated when they gave you that prayer card. You know, the first night here, you were real happy, but how did I know that? <laughs> That's right, sister. Just tell you things are happening. I see you kids coming up to this time. Uh, but yet, being my neighbor, you know those things are godly the truth. Is that right? That's right. Now, if you'll do this, if you'll solemnly believe, now, I'm, I, which you know I'm telling you the truth. All right. Now, if you'll believe what I tell you to be the truth and act up on the same, it's going to leave you and never return again. You believe that? I want you to be the happiest person in Texas while you're here. And when you get to Indiana, be the next the happiest person there because I'm going back there and I, I'll be with you so those will be happy. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, or that same thing. For being male brothers told me once there wasn't an earthly chance for me to ever be well. See where I'm, oh my. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound is. Yes. Now, just talking right now, it's beginning to let up, has Yes, yes, man. See, it's right. You're standing right. You stand there just a few moments to be healed. And you see, it's your faith that does the healing. It's coming on up. You see. Now you want to be happy? Go away singing tomorrow. My, just, just be happy as they can be. Now you're going to feel the difference and know it right here. And if you can feel that here in the presence of the gift, you can have it out there too because he's the giver. Isn't that right? Amen. Now, folks, you excuse me. I was just talking to the lady because she's a neighbor there and so forth. And I was just asking in my heart that the Lord would show me something to her that's just taking place. And I see her when she got, when the brother had her prayer card, she just, oh my, she done like that. I know then. And I told her that. And she was standing there in her room a while ago and looked over sideways and she had a real weary feeling come over and she shut her eyes because the lights were looking gloomy to her. And that's just what I told her. Is, is that the truth, sister? That's her. See, and that builds her faith. Now, about some things that was done here a few weeks ago down at home there, but it might think, well, somebody told him that, you see, but just so it would know right here. You understand, don't you, friend? Now, isn't the Lord wonderful? My uh, friend, it, it doesn't take excitement. It takes true, settled faith. God doesn't work under excitement or screaming or, or stomping or running. You can't stomp the devil and make him go out. You've got to know right where you're standing in the artery now. Isn't that right? The power of God. See, that's what it is. Bala's prophets cut themselves and jumped up on the altar, screamed, O Bala, O Bala, and Elijah said, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that I'm your servant. And the fire began to fall. Isn't that right? It's the authority of knowing, not guessing, but knowing. And now if you just be reverent and watch, it might not seem very much to you. But friends, of these people is getting healed. It's wonderful to them. That's right. And I just be reverent while I have prayer for this little woman's come all the way down here, over a thousand miles down here for this healing. Now be reverent, Sister Roberson. Is that right, Roberson? And now, right now, you're going to be relieved from all your trouble right now. Tomorrow, you're going to feel wonderful. And tonight, it's going to be a new time for you. You're going to be full of smiles and laughing when you go home. See that? And you're going to feel good. And then if it, I want you to say that. Greetings. Always tries to tempt, but thou art here of power over him. And I know tonight that standing right here, the Spirit of the Lord standing here is already beginning to move in upon the woman because she has faith. But she wanted to hear me ask you. And then she'll have faith for your answer. As far as being healed, I know she's already healed. But she wants me to hear you, wants to hear me ask you, Father, and I thank you for that faith for a neighbor woman. And God, I pray that she'll always remain healed and may the power of the enemy never no more bother her. May she be happy, she and her husband. May they live long, happy lives full of service for you. Grant it, Lord, and now I rebuke Satan that he stays away from this woman. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, amen. God bless you, Sister Robeson. You may raise your head, audience. You feel different now. Right. Feel dandy. Now you're going to feel that way all and all. Now if you can feel that way here, you can feel that way out there, you can feel that way back in Jeffersonville. Amen. Amen. Let's say praise the Lord. God bless you, Sister Robeson. Amen. Let's give God a praise like this. Say amen. amen.
and how do you do, sister? Looks like, see, there's something wrong with your foot to begin with, is you? It's in your feet. It's where you've got trouble in your feet. <clears throat> now, those people, I don't know them. Here stands a lady here. I don't know the lady. But I don't know what's wrong with her. But I, I will know if God will just permit just in a few moments. Now, do you give me your undivided attention for just a little while? And this way, while we'll try our best to get just everyone that we can. How do you do, sister? Or right, let's have your hand just right away. You love Jesus with all your hands. Well, yes, ma'am. You have several things. Yes, I see you. You have several things wrong. But one of the things you come to be very far is that what's most serious is the female trouble is involved in the Isn't that right? It's almost a cancer. Although they have this charge of that. It's malignant, but I think so. It's, it's pretty bad. Is, that's true, isn't it? I, I'm not... Ma'am. Hmm. Hmm. It hurts more than the Okay, what I want to 
what you do for your testing. What's that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do that. I tell you what I want you to do. When you go back home, I want you to call uh, uh, 1012 Clark Street, George D.R. You know him? Take an insulin for years. You remember that? I was down to pray with him. You remember that? And he's a man in his 80s. And he's never took insulin from that. Perfectly easy. Is that right? So are you, sir. God bless you. You can raise your head. Everything. Everything. You're here. Let's say praise the Lord, everybody. She's some new old thing. A friend down there, she happens to know him, Mr. D.R., 80 years old. I don't know how much insulin he had to take. and take it for years. When the visit in the scene, he said, Brother Bram, if you just ask the Lord, he'll do it. And I asked the Lord, and he went back, and his doctor said, you're negative. There's not a speck about it over two years ago, and hasn't been negative ever since. The Lord is God, isn't he? Amen. You first heard her, Brad, I'm here to speak about the lady having a tumor on the right, on one of the ovaries, and also the guy, the guy, and she has on her car a female couple, and 